Hello and welcome to the 2022 Principled Entrepreneurship Conference from here in New York City. I'm Matthew Bunsen, Executive Editor of the EWTN News and also Washington Bureau Chief. EWTN is delighted uh, to have a hand, so to speak, in helping the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America and the Napa Institute to present uh, this year's conference on principled entrepreneurship. We are delighted, as I said, to be in New York City uh, to bring you a host of panels uh, throughout the day. Uh, but let's start with the conversation with the executive director of uh, the Napa Institute, John Meyer. John, welcome. Thanks, Matthew. It's great to be here. Well, here we are at uh, this year's uh, conference. It has a, a very specific theme this year, and that is religion-free enterprise and government. And there's yeah. a specific title that, I, that we're going to hear a lot of today, and that is The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism 40 yeah. Years Later. Yeah, one of the great minds of, uh, of kind of business and, and, and faith here is Michael Novak, who wrote The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism 40 years ago. You know, you, you hear this kind of catchphrase in the culture now, democratic socialism and democratic capitalism. What do these right. things mean? And Novak, um, you know, argues that really it's not a choice that for us to be free, we need a free free market, a free democratic society, but then there's a third leg of the stool. We need that, that cultural morality which is given to us from our Judeo-Christian beliefs. And more specifically, as Catholics, we get that from our great social teaching. So kind of that underpinning of social teaching to support a free market and a free society so that we can really flourish as human beings. And we'll hear a lot about that today. The books, the first panel today is about the relevance of that today. Right. Um, it is as relevant today as it ever was, especially with all this talk of socialism and other, other alternatives which restrict human freedom and counter our faith. Well, here was a book that was written what, back in 1982. Yeah. Uh, right in the Reagan boom, we had yeah. uh, an, an era of uh, the Soviet Union still in existence. Yeah. He seemed to understand uh, where capitalism needed to go, but also where so many of the challenges of culture were headed too. 100%, yeah, and, and that's where, you know, we need to look to the church to kind of inform everything, um, inform our politics, inform our, our economics, and, and inform the cultural decisions we make. Um, I think today, one of the dangers we see among Catholics is that they, they, just like the, the political spectrum gets so polarized, you go far right, you go far left, you go right. socialism, you go libertarianism. I, I think a lot of the Catholics, well-meaning Catholics, will, will kind of let their politics inform their faith mm -hmm. instead of their faith informing their politics. And we as Catholics, we're not strict libertarians and we're certainly not socialists. Um, there's kind of, the, some people will call it the third way, some people don't like that term, but there's, there's this, you know, free market, Free, free society that is also informed by, uh, by a very, uh, very much by the church and her teachings. Yeah. So um, we need to make sure that we always bring our faith out into the culture and don't let our culture come into the faith. Yeah. Well, we and I mentioned 1982. Of course, this is yeah. uh, a year after Pope St. John Paul II was uh, almost assassinated. Correct. Uh, his spirit also seems to hang over a lot of these discussions, especially when we're talking about capitalism and the profound reflection he had. Well, he, uh, he wrote, I believe, more encyclicals in the Catholic social doctrine than any pope had written. Yes. Um, and, and part of that was in the environment in which he lived, which, you know, uh, the threat of Marxism was, was everywhere, and there was the debate of the morality of capitalism, socialism, and it, its goods or evils. And um, so he kind of existed at that. And I feel like many of these encyclicals need to be reread today so that we can better understand the same fight that we're in, but in a different way. It's kind of a, a soft totalitarianism is what has been being called today, where we're slowly being infiltrated by the same things that were more hard totalitarian and forced in the 80s is now kind of softly being slowly brought into the culture and, and it's like the boiling uh, frog in the pot. We don't even <laughs> right. realize it's happening. Yeah, and, and John Paul in, in Centesimus Anus and Solicitura Re Socialis sees these profound yeah. uh, social encyclicals, but he was tapping into what was already a deep reflection on the part of the church, starting with Leo the Thirteenth and Rerum Novarum going forward. So to your point then, the church's gift of Catholic social teaching uh, throughout the 20th century, how does that lead to a moment like this discussion now uh, that you're having today? Well, you know, these are living documents and, you know, one of our speakers, Monsignor Martin Schlag, is writing a, a, a critical edition in English first time ever of, of all of the encyclicals um, because it, it's imperative that our leaders in business be able to understand these issues at a core level so that they can be the front lines of evangelization. 
Um, and, that, and that's our hope with this conference, is to equip those who are in positions of leadership, the CEOs, the executives that are behind us that are coming in, not just to know what the church teaches, but to be able to articulate and advance those teachings in the culture. Why is it so dangerous to allow some of these critical theories and other things to creep into their business? And, and why would the church care about those things? You know, what, what is it, how does it define the human person differently than the church does, for example? Um, so I think that a lot of the battles that are being drawn right now are things that we can look back on these encyclicals, even things that are more, you would consider more economic and not the church, um, like a just wage, um, you know, the dignity of work, um, things that you would think, oh, these are, these are more political debates, these aren't uh, faith debates. Well, the beautiful thing about being Catholic is that the church has a lot to say about that, and not only does it have a lot to say about it, it's already said it. Yes. Um, so you can go back and read it and yeah. say, oh, well, you know, this is what I'm talking about, letting your, your faith inform your politics because the wisdom of the church is, is brought to it by its Holy Spirit. This is, this is truth, and we need to take that truth and bring it forward. Is there sometimes a, a misunderstanding of uh, prudential judgments versus things like intrinsic evils? I mean, we, we yeah. have these discussions about immigration, for example, yeah. and there's a lot to be said from the Catholic social teaching side on yeah. immigration, but there seems to be that divide that, that you've noted. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's 100% true. I think that um, um, we have to, you know, there are some areas where we're going to have to make our own judgment. Um, but, you know, as a Catholic, um, it, it's pretty clear in many of the situations which way I should be, should be leaning. Um, that's not to say that, that we're, we're automatons and the church is going to tell us exactly what to say and what to do and all of this, but it is going to give us the, what we need to inform the best decisions on how to deal with the crisis at the border, how to deal with the, the economic policies of today. Um, so. I think that that is our purpose here, is to bring all that up to light. So for Napa, uh, partnering with the, the Bush School at Catholic yeah. University, bringing a conference like this together, uh, first, what are some of the logistical challenges, and, and what are sort of your what's your vision for a conference like this? Well, that's a great question, and you know, one of the challenges is making sure we get this content out broadly, and that's where UW10 is helping us. Um, the Bush School of Business obviously very much aligned with us. We're trying to also use this content to, to get to other business schools, uh, other Catholic business schools to help them understand the importance. Uh, last year we had, uh, uh, maybe, maybe a year before that, we had the Dean of the Business School at Notre Dame, Martin Kremers, and mm -hmm. you know, he's doing a lot of great work there, bringing the social teaching into the undergraduate business studies. Catholic U is the shining example on the hill of this, but many of our Catholic schools don't do this. They, you know, they right. teach business strictly as a secular school would. And for us, there's the common good, there's the dignity of work, all these things we talked about. When a, when a young undergrad leaves a Catholic school, they should be able to articulate these things from a Catholic perspective. And right. um, that's our hope here. First is to bring this out to other Catholic schools, but then secondarily, to get it to as many of these executives as possible. This is a harder group to evangelize than the other groups who evangelize because it's hard to get them in one room at one time. <laughs> yes, right. Um, you know, we do things with politicians. We do things with, you know, apostolate leadership and church leadership. The, uh, the business guys getting their, getting their attention for a few days and, um, and helping them to, to learn something that will help their business um, but isn't something that is a typical trade show where, you know, it's easy for them to make the, the ask to go. It's, it's something where I'm doing this both for faith formation and for the health of my business. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Michael Novak, and, and he's going to be hovering over so many yeah. of the discussions today. The, those three pillars of uh, the democratic polity of a market system, but then that question of that third pillar of culture and, and morality. Yeah. Is one of your goals here to help train uh, entrepreneurs to go out then, yeah. transform business, but then also to have that influence in culture? Yeah, I think uh, you know, one of the quotes he makes in the book, and I wrote it down, is um, you know, capitalism requires leadership, which draws from the ideals of fraternity and community, um, but also inspires self-sacrifice for the common good. So right. I think that's what we're looking for here. Um, instead of having these guys take the easy way out, understanding that um, this woke capitalism, as we had the conference on woke capitalism during COVID, um, which was all online, which was great because it got out far and wide when woke capitalism was a term a lot of people hadn't heard of. <laughs> right. But the idea that the, the, the CEOs in this room hold tremendous power to influence the culture. Yeah. And if they stand by idly while, while woke type ideas are being pushed through their organization and they do it, they allow it quietly because they don't want to ruffle any feathers, so we'll just allow this to happen. 
how they're contributing to the evil in society then, um, you know, rather than the good and how you can contribute to the good by, by taking a different position. Um, you know, unfortunately in today's world, culture is less influenced by the church and more by corporations and entertainment. Yeah. So um, we need to be on the front lines of all of those things and that's why Napa is trying to take these people of influence um, and, and showing them how to then go out and change the culture themselves. You and I had a discussion uh, in this same venue a year ago yeah. uh, when we were broadcasting this same conference and yeah. I asked you basically to forecast what you think was coming in, in the near future. Okay. Hey, I'm sure that was very accurate at the time. Yeah, I, I don't remember what I forecasted, but I hope it was accurate. <laughs> well, I think one of your grave concerns was the, the influence of this sort of woke culture uh, yeah. on business. And yeah. it's been a, a kind of a long year, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it, it's been a long couple of years. You know, I remember when we first started talking about woke capitalism just a few years ago, most people in the room had never heard the term woke. You know, CEOs, bishops, they're like, well, what do you mean by woke? Right. It's like, well, now woke is part of the regular vernacular. Everyone knows what woke means. Um, and even if they deny it. Yeah, even if they deny it, they know what it means. And uh, you know, we like to say we're awake, not woke, like uh, there's a great book written that way um, with that title. Um, because, you know, really, wokeness, um, you know, we need to be awake to the fact that wokeness exists and also to the truth of reality. Yes. Um, so I think that we can't stand by idly, and that's the point we're making with these CEOs, and allow these things to be pushed. We have to be brave enough to bring Christ out into the world. Similar to the way we brought Christ out yesterday in the Eucharistic procession, we have to be bold in our faith and advancing, you know, self-sacrifice. I have to be willing to stand up for what's true, even if it's not good for, for my, my well-being financially. I mean, God will take care of us. We can't just stand by idly. It's, it's, it's sinful to do so. Well, that's a perfect segue to the, the question about yesterday and the Eucharistic procession. You did one last year, uh, yeah. a bit of a surprise to everybody. Uh, yeah. First, the reaction, uh, yeah. and then to New Yorkers. This one was even more deliberate yeah. uh, and was pretty spectacular. Well, we learned a lot last year. Doing anything in New York, you learn the first time. So last year, we did a smaller in uh, invite group. Um, we went up the avenues, so we had to go up the sidewalks, all of this. This year, we worked with the same NYPD. We had a they're so fantastic in working. Um, the, I think most of them are probably Catholic, it seems. Um, I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, they, they were so fantastic that we, had a, we, we intentionally invited a large group and we went down the streets so they could close the streets down. Yeah. Um, and, and that brings a lot more attention. I think we left the church, you know, nine, uh, eight blocks away, left the church with 400 people that we had invited and we arrived with maybe a, a thousand to twelve hundred because people had just joined the procession from behind and you know last year the bishop had said we'll see three different types of faces we'll see those that are in awe those who are confused and wondering what's going on and those who are angry and you know you would think you'd see a lot more of the angry there's only one or two here or there that you see most of the people you know it's the cell phone era so they're not sure what's going on so they're taking pictures but yes. you have other people who just drop to their kneels and knees and kneel on the street there's, yeah. there's there's people who are you know move the tears there are people who just get in the line you don't know the graces that happen when you bring our lord out into the street but i mean we went right through times square we closed down and crossed fifth avenue um i mean this is this is a bold witness to the faith and it struck me there um, that so many people have never seen this because we as Catholics aren't being bold enough in bringing our faith out into the public square. Right. You know, Eucharistic procession should be more common. Um, I always find great graces that come personally and, and organizationally through the processions that we do do. But this the bold witness um, to show people our faith publicly like that. And even if they don't know what's going on, the wonder that it creates, um, you don't know the hearts that are being moved. We'll never know the grace that was presented there, but I'm sure of all the things we do this weekend, that will provide the most. There was there were a couple of moments, uh, the juxtaposition of this procession passing through uh, across Broadway, yeah. at Times Square, yeah. uh, then you had Radio City Music Hall, you had Fifth Avenue, yeah. uh, all of these great testaments uh, to mercantilism, to affluence, uh, to media, all of them with the, the this Eucharistic procession, our Lord sort of cutting right through all of it. No, I think that was part of the planning here. Is how <laughs> yes. can we go right through Times Square, 
how can we go right through not just Fifth Avenue, but the heart of commercial Fifth Avenue? Right. Um, you know, it was, um, I think that was a beautiful testament. We had these loud speakers this year so that the choir wouldn't be drowned out because you go through Times Square and there's just noise everywhere. So, yes. you know, we had these loud speakers that you turned up, there were three of them, and, you know, you just had, you know, the Pange Lingua echoing through Times Square. <laughs> it was, yes. uh, you know, it was really quite a beautiful thing. Um, you know, moved me emotionally many times yesterday. Um, just thinking about, you know, journeying with Jesus, as Father Landry had said in his homily, you know, right. we walked with Jesus today. We took him out into a broken city full of hurting people and brought that mercy out, you know, just like the disciples walking with him, you know, in the first century and people who needed healing. There were, you know, people who needed his healing and we brought him through the streets and hopefully some of that healing happened. Yeah. Pope Francis uses the phrase uh, parousia, of yeah. this boldness of yeah. being willing to take that risk of yeah. going out.